And uh, I guess I should probably begin by telling you a little bit about my personal story uh, and tell you how I became interested in a subject of esoteric religion. Um, as a youth, I was prone to dreams and visions of a quasi-religious nature, and most significantly, a recurring visitation from a silhouetted figure. And my earliest memories of this figure uh, come from my infancy in Uganda. I had a nightmare in which it was looming at my bedroom door. Over the years, it seemed to show up again during chaotic, stressful periods in my childhood and adolescence. And things took a distinctly a mystical turn on a trip to Glastonbury. When I dreamt, I saw it within the tower on the tour. Uh, it appeared to be standing behind an altar. But as I drew closer, I realized there was a mirror there. And I was in fact gazing at my own silhouette as I stood at the arched doorway with the sunlight coming from behind me. Uh, so I decided to study religion uh, after I learned in my late teens that this was ostensibly at least an autonomous being with which I could communicate. Uh, that realization came during a particularly dark period of alcohol and drug addiction. Uh, I saw the silhouette at my bedroom door again, and it spoke to me. Uh, among other things, it told me that it loved me. Uh, and at that point, I was a Freudian materialist, so I was rather skeptical. Um, and in response to my skepticism, the figure turned towards me. I had, in fact, been viewing its back. And as it turned, I was blinded by an intense white light. Uh, the experience was very libidinal uh, and rather terrifying. I thought I was dying or going mad. And I hadn't been brought up in a religious environment. But this encounter sparked my interest in the phenomenology of Judeo-Christian mysticism and specifically in the figure of Enoch slash Metatron. In time, I also learned that I could, again, ostensibly summon this being through the use of serotonergic psychedelics, such as LSD, uh, particularly when used in conjunction with a mirror. So, the first volume of my work, The Path of the Serpent, is entitled Psychedelics and the Neuropsychology of Gnosis. And in this volume, I conceptualize my experience in terms of the neuropsychology of hypoegoic states, i.e. states of consciousness in which the functions of the ego are relativized or altogether abolished. As my own case history demonstrates, hypoegoic states can be triggered by various psychonautic techniques, and they can also emerge spontaneously in the course of the process of individuation or psychological growth, which is characterized by sporadic adaptive crises and restructuring events. The recent resurgence in the laboratory study of the classical serotonergic psychedelics above all the serotonin analogues, psilocybin, dimethyltryptamine, and LSD, uh, allow us to interpret these states of consciousness in terms of the near criticality of the human nervous system. From this perspective, the brain and wider nervous system are perpetually poised at the verge of restructuring events, which occur when the system is pushed beyond a critical threshold by stresses or intentional catalysts, such as entheogens and various ecstatic practices. And these events involve a breakdown of the neural hierarchy and its disruption of the neural connectivity underlying inflexible, maladaptive psychological structures. So it's a rather pretty uh, image for you. Um, in near critical systems, transitional events of this kind conform to a power law, i.e. their size is inversely proportional to their frequency. 
the fractals of the Mandelbrot set are a visual representation of power laws with which you're probably familiar. Uh, these are self-similar geometrical objects in which the structure of the whole recurs more or less exactly in the structure of its parts across many scales. Uh, fractals uh, appear uh, pretty much ubiquitously in nature. They're indicative of, of uh, systems operating near a critical threshold or in popular parlance at the edge of chaos. These, these are fractal structures of the Nile above the Aswan Dam. You can see that the parts uh, mirror the structure of the whole. Uh, near critical systems maintain a delicate balance of rigidity and flexibility. In the case of the brain, a degree of structural rigidity is necessary for a coherent functioning identity and purpose, while flexibility allows us to adapt to a dangerous and ever-changing environment through the emergence of qualitatively new properties, structures, and behaviors. For this reason, the observed near criticality of the nervous system is often described by neuroscientists as an adaptive mechanism. Uh, nevertheless, we occupy a nested hierarchy of systems, society, biosphere, cosmos, which all appear to display near critical edge of chaos dynamics, a fact which suggests we are dealing with a precondition for the evolution of life rather than an evolved mechanism per se. So the first volume of The Path of the Serpent explores a particular class of serpentine axis symbolism, interpreting it as a paradigmatic expression of near critical neural dynamics, and more broadly of a ubiquitous natural process of creatio ex caro, uh, that is creation from chaos. The symbolism in question is widespread among shamanic cultures and is also central to Indo-Tibetan Tantra and the Western Gnostic traditions, which stretch from the ancient Gnostics proper through to the Kabbalah in its Jewish, Christian and post-Christian occultist forms. Within the latter traditions, the principal expression of the cosmic axis is the enigmatic figure of the Christian cross entwined by a serpent. Uh, which we find assimilated with the Sephirotic tree of life from quite an early stage in the development of the Kabbalah, namely in the work of Abulafia. As the nexus of destruction and creative renewal, the serpent's central situation in the cosmos reflects our ever-present life-enabling proximity to chaos. It's the locus of the cosmogony, the sacred site where the cosmos eternally comes into being. As such, it's a place of transition and liminality, a transformative threshold leading to other states of being. These states are reached through the cultivation of religious ecstasy via fasting, chanting, active imagination, entheogen use, etc. Hence, the axis forms an itinerary of ecstatic ascent through the celestial spheres to a realm beyond the rule of the stars and planets. The intermediaries dwelling at the stellar threshold to the heavenly spheres also appear in serpentine forms, most notably the figures of Metatron, Christ, and the Gnostic Demiurge. Uh, drawing upon my own visions of a transformative serpentine power, I argue that this ecstatic, uh, this esoteric imagery lying at the heart of the Gnostic traditions has its origins, in part at least, in the hyperegoic states of consciousness typically produced by ecstatic practices. Hence, the breakdown of the neural hierarchy at the critical threshold involves a fragmentation of the personality into autonomous subsystems linked to powerful emotions and anomalous somatovisceral sensations. Historically, these ascending signals from the limbic system and the wider nervous system have been interpreted in terms of melathesia, or the relationship of particular parts of the body 
with the celestial spheres and their associated angels or gods. As higher neural networks relinquish control over lower, visionary symbolism arises as an interoceptive phenomenon, i.e. as the perception of internal bodily states that are normally subliminal under the neural regimes of everyday life. Above all, the quasi-tantric practices of the Gnostic traditions involve the cultivation of lucidity, an interoceptive meta-awareness of the ego, which grants insight into previously unconscious complexes and somatically encoded trauma. Okay, just see if my slide is working okay. Ah, oh, yes, it's back again. This is actually a, uh, an image from a book which I'm translating at the moment um, by the Austrian magus uh, Emil Steiner. Uh, and uh, in writing the first volume of The Path of the Serpent, I didn't intend to reduce the profound transformative experiences uh, that I'm exploring to the status of neurobiological epiphenomena. Rather, I drew upon theories of biological relativity to argue that the idiosyncratic serpentine imagery I was exploring arises from an immeasurable network of mutually entwined systems, and that we're not dealing with a sign pointing back towards a unique neurobiological event, so much as an archetypal symbol with no final referent. Moreover, as interoceptive representations of critical junctures in the life of the psyche, the imagery in question lends itself readily to the description of parallel junctures observable in the nested hierarchy of systems around us. Indeed, the structural correspondence of the whole to its parts uncovered by the contemporary science of complex systems provides an important physical basis for pre-modern models of macro, uh, macro microcosmic correspondence and the age old intuition that processes of inner and outer transformation are intimately related appears to be valid in previously unimagined ways. And the same can be said for uh, long standing fractal uh, conceptions of the cosmic axis in the Western Gnostic traditions. You can see more of those fractal representations my next slide. It's all going rather slowly here, probably because this PowerPoint is so massive with all the animations I've put into it. Uh, this is from Christian uh, uh, Knorr von Rosenroth's uh, Kabula Denudata, the 17th century compendium. Uh, showing the uh, fractal uh, representation of the sephirot. So each, um, each sephira contains the entire tree of life uh, within it. <clears throat> uh, so tying together psychedelics and neuroscience with the esoteric doctrines and practices of the Western Gnostic traditions, may all sound rather abstract and speculative. However, in the second volume of The Path of the Serpent, which will be published by Rubido Press next year, I turn from the neuropsychology to the history of Gnosis and the Gnostic traditions. And I show how Christian Kabbalistic conceptualizations of Gnosis informed early neuroscientific precursors of the critical brain hypothesis. And I begin with the fascinating episode from the life of the early modern Flemish alchemist, Jan Baptist of Van Helmont, who experimented with the powerful psychedelic Wolfsbane in the hope of discovering the seat of the immortal human soul. The tract described in this experiment is very aptly called a crazy idea, as Wolfsbane is a highly toxic plant utilized as an ingredient in the witch's flying ointments. In the course of this experiment, Van Helmont noted uh, the emergence of a secondary center of consciousness 
in the vicinity of his stomach and heart, while his head continued to conduct its business quite independently of this new center of perception. <clears throat> in this hypoegoic state, Van Helmont seemed to possess powers of understanding which were far superior to those he had formerly received from his brain. He interpreted this second center in terms of the archaeus, an individuating, will-creating power akin to the Gnostic demiurge, <clears throat> which brings forth all things from the primeval chaos and which rules over seven lesser archaei, regulating the functions of our organs. Following Paracelsus, Van Helmont writes that the seven organs and their archaei correspond to the seven planets and their governing spirits, while the ruling archaeus corresponds to the eighth sphere of fixed stars. And drawing on Van Helmont's identification of the location of this secondary subliminal center of perception, the followers of Mesmer emphasize the role in animal magnetism of the solar plexus and other prevertebral ganglia innovating organs in the abdominal cavity, uh, which appear to be peculiarly sensitive to magnetic passes or hand gestures. In turn, advances in anatomical knowledge in the early 19th century gave rise to a theoretical concern with the decentralization of neural networks and a concomitant rise of the autonomic periphery in the genesis of hypoegoic states of consciousness, such as those famously attained by the CRS of Prevorst, uh, Friederike Halfer, who you can see in the picture here. So the, second, the central concern of the second volume of The Path of the Serpent is to explore the serpentine forms of this demiurgic figure in the Gnostic traditions, focusing in particular on its role in the ascent through the celestial spheres and their microcosmic counterparts along the human neuraxis, i.e. the longitudinal axis of the central nervous system those serpentine forms have remained remarkably consistent down through the millennia, which testify to an enduring association with Christ, a chiliastic concern with the passing of the cosmic ages, and a persistent blurring of identity between the rulers of the heavenly and the infernal hierarchies. I begin with the Red Book of Carl Gustav Jung, here at its incipit, we can see the crowned serpent of the ecliptic associated with the procession of the equinoxes and the passing of the platonic months. Uh, Jung's technique of active imagination has very clear magical and Kabbalistic precursors. And among the best known of Jung's red book visions is his transformation into the crucified Christ entwined by a serpent. Uh, his face subsequently turns into uh, that of a, a lion. The proximal origins of this imagery lie primarily in the work of G.R.S. Mead and in the collaboration of the Theosophical Society's esoteric section with the Golden Dawn via the so-called inner group. So tracing the historical genealogy of this imagery, I explore the Rosicrucian and Kabbalistic motifs of the Golden Dawn's Vault of the Adepts, uh, which is, of course, uh, slides are slowing up again. And that imagery is, of course, uh, principally derived from the description of the tomb of Christian Rosenkreutz given in the Pharma Fraternitatis. Upon the floor of the vault is a serpent associated with the seven lower rulers or planetary spirits. The brethren of the Pharma Fraternitatis declare they are in possession of the dominion and powers of these rulers, presumably by a knowledge of their names and characters, but they are not willing to prostitute such dangerous secrets to the public. 
Later traditions, such as that of the Golden Dawn, interpret the mirrored upper and lower powers of the vault in terms of the Lurianic doctrine of the uh, Clifot. But similar motifs are present in the medieval treatise of the left emanation, which describes the seven demonic princes of the Sitra Ahra, the other side, and their angelic counterparts from the upper tree of life. Particulars concerning the serpent in its higher white aspect are fewer and further between in the historical record, although fleeting references are to be found in manuscripts related to the magia metatrona, the metatronic magic of the highest grade of the golden Rosenkreutz, uh, that of Magus. This theurgical tradition stems from a confluence of Rosicrucian and Bamanist currents in 17th century Holland, and it bears a close historical relationship to the practices of Johann Georg Gichtel's Engelsbrüder, the angelic brethren. Thus, one golden Rosenkreuz manuscript I uncovered at the Bavarian State Library contains references to the esoteric significance of symbolism utilized in Michel Andrier's well-known copper plate engravings for the printed works of Burma. These allusions include a reference to the white serpent of purity as a heavenly counterpart of the serpent you can see pictured here, which is the world ruler governing the celestial bodies and encircling the realm of fate. This mirroring of the symbolic elements of the upper light world and lower shadow world follows the psychocosmological structure established by Jacob Burma in his own Miraculous Eye of Eternity diagram, which I also uh, go into. We find the relationship of the white serpent to Christ depicted in the Golden Rosenkreuz manuscript text, Magia Metatrona, which represents the crowned Kabbalistic serpent at the foot of the cross, bathed in fluids emanating from the five holy wounds. Uh, related imagery is also to be found in the Clavis Inferni, pictured here, an 18th century magical manuscript associated with the Rosicrucian metatronic magic. In fact, I actually suspect this is a, a Golden Rosenkreuz manuscript. Oops. Too fast. Ah, oh, yes, there we go. So, in my second volume, I describe the practices lying behind these motifs, which in the Rosicrucian context are directed towards an inner rebirth via Christ and the seven Quellgeister, the source spirits, which are the Bamanist equivalent of the seven lower Sephiroth. These source spirits exist within the human microcosm as psychic qualities or powers of the soul. And as in the macrocosm, they possess malevolent counterparts. This engraving from the work of Gichtel depicts the unregenerate soul straying from the heart in a centripetal spiraling motion and falling under the sway of these malevolent powers. <clears throat> and likewise, the Gnostic rebirth begins with the return inwards to the heart, the seat of solar influence, where Christ, as the divine presence, the feminine Shekinah, initiates a second centripetal motion of the soul and breaks the seven seals, pride, avarice, lust, egotism, etc., that bind the corresponding benevolent qualities of the Quellgeister. Uh, beyond its Kabbalistic precursors, the serpentine uh, imagery here reflects a particular vision experienced by Gichtel upon his imprisonment, when Christ emerged from an inner light to slay a serpent wound three, three times about his heart, as you can see here in the engraving. The liberation of the seven benevolent powers of the soul 
is likened in the Behmenis and Rosicrucian text to the breaking of the seven seals and also to the lighting of the menorah, the seven branch candelabrum of the tabernacle, as the seven source spirits are shining stars which must be lit within you. Uh, here you can see a golden Rosenkreutz text uh, as a, a magus of the order uh, demonstrating the opening of the seven seals within you, which are these uh, uh, seven uh, Quellgeister being freed. Again, things are sort of slowing up at my end. I'll just try to get back to the correct slide. Um, probably see them going backwards and forwards at your end, but ah, yes, there we are. So various artifacts of Electrum Magicum, an alloy of the, of the seven metals, were utilized by the Golden Rosenkreuz to access the three heptarchies, divine, stellar, and infernal, within the human soul. <clears throat> you find some of these uh, artifacts in use uh, among members of the Golden Dawn as well. Uh, these included scrying instruments such as Solomonic mirrors and the hallowed Urim and Thummim of the Magi, as well as spirit summoning bells engraved with the characters of infernal spirits, planetary angels, and the seven archangels governing them. <clears throat> On the right there, you can also see uh, an animated statue uh, of Electrum, Electrum Magicum. Uh, the use of these artifacts can be traced to the practices of the 16th century alchemist and Christian Kabbalist Heinrich Kunrat, uh, which are detailed here in a remarkable manuscript tableau from the British Library which was uncovered by my uh, colleague, Peter Forshaw. Uh, if you look uh, closely, uh, you can see there's Heinrich Kunrat, uh, in all likelihood, um, at uh, the altar in his oratory. And if we zoom in a little bit, <clears throat> We can see the Urim and Tumim, uh, which had a slightly different form in this sort of 16th century, uh, turn of the 17th century in incarnation, uh, and are related to uh, the uh, Amphitheatrum, a very famous text of Kunrat. Uh, we can also see to the right uh, on the altar um, a bell. Uh, again, the Electrum Magicum uh, bell, which is uh, described in a manuscript of Heinrich Kunrat. I actually have a little um, a replica, an Austrian replica of that bell here, uh, which actually you probably can't see terribly well because I'm sharing the screen. Um, I guess I should probably. Uh, end things fairly soon because I could keep going on for ages as uh, I do trace this uh, genealogy of uh, serpentine symbolism and related practices uh, right back to the ancient Gnostics via the Kabbalah. Uh, I'll just quickly go over the remaining slides uh, uh, which uh, in, uh, include this one of the uh, Telai which is the um, <clears throat> uh, serpent of the cosmic axis, uh, also the, the cosmic periphery uh, in the uh, Jewish tradition, and which is associated in the Kabbalistic tradition uh, by Abilafia in particular uh, with Metatron, with the two dual aspects of Metatron, uh, with the sort of back in front of Metatron. This is idea of uh, a divine power which is fundamentally um, ambiguous in the sense that it's at that stellar threshold. Uh, and one side of it is uh, facing uh, upwards 
uh, towards Ein Sof, the infinite, uh, the endless, and the other side, which is uh, looking downwards uh, towards us, uh, and which um, has a malevolent aspect, it's a world ruling aspect. And uh, these motifs in the Kabbalah, as Gershon Sholem and other uh, scholars of the Kabbalah have shown, uh, can be traced back to ancient Gnosticism, uh, particularly via the uh, Merkava mystics and the Hekelot literature. And I look in particular at the serpentine imagery of uh, the uh, heretical, well, so-called serpent cults of the ancient Near East, Gnostic cults, uh, in which uh, serpent plays a very central role. Here's the famous Ophite diagram, which, as in the Kabbalah, you find the, uh, the serpent figure, the Leviathan, uh, at the center and the circumference uh, at the um, uh, eighth sphere of the six stars, and uh, which plays uh, very important role. Uh, it's associated with Christ, plays an important salvific role uh, in uh, the, um, uh, the rites, the Gnostic rites of these uh, serpent cults, uh, which are uh, you know, remarkably similar to um, what we would think of today as um, Kundalini, um, you know, sort of quasi-tantric, uh, uh, practices of the Kabbalah. Um, so they in involve an ascent along this uh, near axis, the sort of microcosmic equivalent of the cosmic axis, um, which is conceptual conceptualized in terms of the uh, serpent of the cosmic axis, so the serpentine path, basically. And beyond the ancient Gnostics, I uh, trace this imagery further back to uh, uh, this, this sort of Mithraic aspect of it, which I explore, but further back to uh, Egyptian precursors. Um, here's the uh, serpent Mehen, sort of counterpart of Apophis in the uh, journey of Ra um, through the, uh, the 12 hours of the night. Um, and sort of parallel, paralleling the uh, journeys of the soul after death. So it's a very important precursor to the Gnostic traditions, uh, which I'm talking about. And still further back to um, Babylonian, Sumerian uh, precursors of this imagery in the Chaos Kampf uh, mythology. So the mythology in which uh, uh, serpentine creator deities and their battle with the solar uh, deity figure very, very prominently. Um, so I, I guess I, I, I omitted that uh, platonic sort of source, uh, which I do actually explore in my second volume, a platonic source of the imagery. Uh, so I think as I, I write on the blurb uh, on the back of the um, cover of my first volume, uh, there's this uh, dual origins of the imagery in this Karls Kampf mythology, um, this Semitic uh, mythology, but also uh, in the uh, Platonic uh, cosmic axis imagery, uh, particularly related, related to the uh, Timaeus of Plato, uh, and Plato's um, ideas on the descent of the soul uh, through the uh, celestial spheres, and it's sort of a cruel of these, uh, uh, I guess you could call them shells or um, layers, um, astrologically determined layers, um, which the journey back to the one, uh, to Gnosis, we, we sort of unpeel those layers, those shells again, um, as, we're, as we're ascending uh, through the celestial spheres. Uh, 
so you know again uh, these are uh, motifs which remain remarkably consistent across two millennia of uh, esoteric practice. Uh, and uh, I'm really uh, trying to emphasize the fact that we are dealing here with a matter of biology, human biology. So I'm not reducing it to human biology. Um, I'm very interested in the way in which a visionary experience um, these, in these, during these hyperagoic states, uh, we gather all sorts of images. Um, uh, also from the uh, cultural data banks, uh, which are available to us, the esoteric traditions, perhaps, in which we're being initiated. Uh, and we clothe our experiences with those um, with that cultural data, with the with the with that imagery, uh, but there is a, a matter of biology, um, in a sense, beneath that uh, sort of cultural layer, and in a sense, I look upon my work as a little bit of an antidote to the postmodern uh, overemphasis, as I see it, on the cultural to the neglect of uh, the biological. Right. But that is something I also touch upon, uh, in part during my uh, uh, first volume. Uh, my first volume is really centered around an, an analysis of a serpentine vision, uh, which I had uh, well, not on ayahuasca, but on DMT, dimethyltryptamine, which, as most of you will know, is uh, the chief or one of the chief uh, uh, active uh, ingredients of the ayahuasca uh, potion from the Amazon. And the uh, serpentine imagery. Uh, uh, serpentine cosmic axis imagery, in fact, is uh, very prominent in these shamanic traditions, uh, including those which uh, utilize ayahuasca in the uh, Amazon basin uh, and surrounding areas. Um, so yes, I do, I do go into um, uh, these traditions. In the Western Gnostic traditions, I'm also, I also go into the use of entheogens. Uh, ayahuasca itself is not used as, I'm, as far as I'm aware in the Western traditions. However, I did discover a use of, uh, it seems to be a use of a, a, a native European source of dimethyltryptamine, DMT, uh, which is in fact the common reed, Phragmites astralis, um, which is uh, burnt uh, in uh, entheogenic incense. So with other, uh, together with other common entheogenic um, incense ingredients such as um, uh, mandrake, and um, henbane and, and so forth, some of the, some of the nightshades, which are you know, ra rather dangerous. And I uh, discuss some of the, uh, the rather dire consequences uh, which are um, uh, recorded um, in the uh, historical texts that I've, I've looked at there. Uh, as far as the Gnostics are concerned, there are some indications of the use of a psychoactive uh, Eucharistic uh, wine. Uh, so uh, again, this is sort of focus on the blood of Christ, sort of this imbibing of the flesh of the gods, um, uh, the flesh of Christ. And in the case of at least one, uh, uh, Gnostic sect. Uh, this seems to have been uh, of, of a psychoactive nature, though it's not entirely clear what the psychoactive ingredient was. Uh, 
Uh, but I go into that in the second volume of my book. To be frank, I'm not terribly well versed in the 20th century developments uh, and in contemporary developments. Um, I, uh, I, I, I'm pretty much uh, focused on the uh, uh, pre-modern uh, traditions and I'm only aware of the uh, modern and contemporary ones in, insofar as they kind of follow on from that sort of interest of mine in the pre-modern ones. Uh, so that's really interesting that uh, serpentine forms are appearing in ufology. I, I didn't know that. I, I'd, I'd love to learn more about that. Um, my only entrance to the world of ufology really comes by uh, Carl Gustav Jung, uh, who I sort of read avidly when I was younger. Um, and he did write a work on uh, flying saucers, uh, a modern myth of things seen in the sky, I think was the subtitle. And he deals there with uh, the uh, symbolism of ufology as um, a continuation of archetypal symbolism, which uh, can be found uh, in sort of previously in a, in a religious uh, and uh, mystical context. Uh, so, yes, yeah, cer certainly, uh, yeah, that's the way I would approach uh, that kind of imagery appearing uh, today in the uh, context of UFOs. Um, though I don't have any uh, great uh, knowledge of that area. Okay, yes, yeah, so again, I'm not sure, um, you know, I've covered such a massive amount of um, material in both books, um, but I didn't get to the Minoans, I'm afraid. Um, and I dare say uh, there are connections there. And you know, I'm just, you know, I have an image in mind of, uh, is it a female figure holding two serpents, one in each hand? Um, from my, I seem to recall that from my visit to, uh, to Crete. Um, but um, I really don't know a great deal about it, except to say that uh, the relationship between the goddess powers, uh, these uh, what seem, seems to be an earlier strata of goddess uh, figures who at some point are kind of overtaken or supplanted by, uh, appear to be supplanted by patriarchal religion. Um, but these earlier uh, 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 female deities are strongly associated with uh, serpentine uh, figures and uh, this seems to be a result of the um, uh, this this principle of uh, creation from chaos, uh, which I'm basically trying to um, explore in in my books at some length. Um, so the, um, I, I do go into Celsus, um, when I'm looking at the Ophite diagram, uh, I'm really looking there at the, um, symbolism of the serpent. So I'm really very focused on that. So PD, if you, if you could send me this, um, material on, on the white ungent, I'd be really interested, uh, uh to see that. And as, that part of my book is still uh, in formation. Uh, I could certainly include um, any relevant information there, uh, which you could supply to me. Uh, I'd be very interested in that. Uh, when I'm looking at uh, the use of entheogens in the, uh, in the Gnostic traditions that I'm studying, and I guess in, in these sort of related mysteries, mystery cults uh, 
and particularly in, in Mithraism, um, but also, I mean, there is uh, certainly anthrogen anti use in uh, other uh, mystery cults in, in antiquity. I'm very careful, um, as I am kind of throughout my work, uh, not to be too speculative, um, perhaps, perhaps a little too careful, um, in the sense that I'm um, uh, just uh, relying on uh, very explicit references. Um, so um, when it comes to you know, guessing what these substances might have been, for example, within the, uh, the mystery cults, uh, Eleusis, for example, uh, the speculation regarding mushrooms and, and so forth, uh, or DMT, uh, as in your, your own work, uh, PD. Uh, I'm also really interested in, in those speculations, but I don't go quite that far myself. I'm sort of keep that question open. Uh, and I don't really offer uh, offer much um, in that regard in terms of my own guesses. Um, I do uh, go into the witches ointments a little bit because um, they are quite um, quite important and they're related, as it seems, to uh, psychoactive. Uh, incenses which are used in the tre treasure hunting uh, tradition, magical treasure hunting traditions in uh, early modern German-speaking lands, but also as it appears in the uh, pseudo-Solomonic literature, uh, at, le at least the late medieval uh, pseudo-Solomonic literature which precedes that uh, uh, treasure hunting tradition. Uh, in the German land. So uh, I go into that a little bit. Um, yeah, Herbert Silbera is such an interesting figure. Uh, he was a psychoanalyst who was actually closer to Freud. I mean, he, he stayed with Freud after the split between Freud and Jung. But in, in certain respects, he his ideas were closer to, to Jung's than to Freud's. And uh, Jung actually derived, I think, quite some of his ideas on alchemy from uh, Silbera. Uh, Silbera, I found really interesting and really valuable uh, when he was writing about, uh, as you mentioned, autosymbolic imagery, which is kind of a, a central part of my thesis in the first volume, because I'm looking at the way in which the uh, human nervous system isn't a unitary entity, or at least it's not always a unitary entity, and it has this capacity to uh, fragment uh, into um, autonomous communities of neurons, uh, which can communicate with one another, and uh, dissociation, uh, you know, such as we find it in uh, hypnagogic states, uh, so when we're um, half asleep, half awake. And of course, uh, uh, Silber was uh, experimenting with sleep deprivation, uh, as well as with certain uh, occult techniques, um, basically scrying. Uh, uh, in his study of this, uh, these autosymbolic uh, phenomena, and you know, I, I'm referring to, to to these phenomena in terms of interoception. So, uh, the, the perception of internal processes, and you know, within within that sort of broad uh, sphere of interoceptive phenomena, uh, we do find the unearthing of somatically encoded trauma. So that's, you know, one very important uh, kind of psychoanalytic tool, um, uh, which uh, is, is offered by the cultivation of these autosymbolic or lucid, uh, lucid states. Uh, 
Uh, poor old Herbert Silbera, though, um, was rejected by Freud. I mean, this, this idea of uh, autosymbolic phenomena was rejected. And his uh, dabbling with the occult uh, was also rejected. You know, uh, Freud made it very clear to Jung uh, and to all its followers that you, you just shouldn't go, uh, uh, don't get involved with uh, the, the black tide of mud of occultism, uh, were his words. So uh, eventually, uh, actually shortly after his paper on autosymbolic phenomena was you know, really pilloried at a meeting of the Viennese Psychoanalytic Society, he committed suicide. Uh, hard to say exactly you know, how far the rejection was responsible for that and how, how far these fairly dangerous um, techniques that he was experimenting with uh, were responsible. But uh, yeah, he's an absolutely fascinating figure. I really find Silbra Know, very, uh, very valuable. Uh, it's just a shame he didn't live longer and develop his ideas further. Yeah, and so, you know, he was really you know, quite well aware of the, the sort of Gnostic traditions and the, the Hermetic traditions. Uh, and, you know, he was very interested in the, in the way in which we, uh, the, these interreceptive mechanisms uh, take, uh, uh, data from various sources, um, I mean, sort of implanted uh, in various ways, uh, and uh, clothe the experience, a sort of dissociative experience uh, with a certain imagery. Uh, yeah, he's, he's fascinating. Yeah. Yes, I must, you know, that, that sort of dependent on, um, on my finances to some extent as how, how fast I can, I can work on it uh, depends on uh, you know, how much time I have to uh, devote to um, uh, staying alive. But I, I do have some uh, a good translation work at the moment, uh, as I mentioned, uh, which should keep me going for a little while. And uh, I should have it ready by, uh, uh, middle of next year and hopefully uh, towards the end of next year it should it should appear with rubido press so that's my that's my aim Cheerio. Uh -huh. thank you thank you thank you thank you